But it is sad to see my colleagues now divided among themselves, whereas when I first started out, there was quite a bit of unity. And um, in unity, there was strength. And now they're losing a lot of that strength. I'm going to start talk. I, I would like to now turn to a discussion of how I see wars closer to the experience of people in this room, that is, the wars you know more about than the Abbas Georgian War, uh, talk about how I've come to understand the power of story making in peacemaking and in war making. And I um, go back to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. I don't know how much you know about the details of how uh, people got into the war. This new movie that's out, by the way, if you've seen it, what is it, So-and-So's War? Thank you. I haven't seen the movie, but I've been told that um, it's not relevant to what I'm telling you now. So uh, that is, the Soviet military command, OK, let me start back. The US and the Russian and the Soviets were trying to, to woo the Afghans um, in the pre-Soviet, in the late 1970s, by giving aid. So the US was giving aid. The Soviets were giving aid. They were finding themselves com competing in this arena. And at some point, um, the Soviet military command, we still don't understand what the motivation was and whether or not they believed this to be true or not. But they were able to convince the Politburo that um, Amin, at that time um, leader in Afghanistan, was going to allow the US to put missiles, to establish missile, missiles in Afghanistan. And in fact, no such plan was happening. The US was really not interested in this area, other than that piddly kind of aid. But a huge story got made up. And I say, I don't know whether they believed it to be true, whether you can accredit that to you know, the xenophobia, the historical xenophobia of the Russians, uh, which lasts till today, which is basically anybody who's not a Russian can't be trusted and is out to get us. And I lived there in the Soviet Union for 20 years and I loved my Russian companions and I loved very many things about the Soviet Union. Um, but the xenophobia was one thing that propelled me out of there because I felt as though no matter how tri I tried to go native, I could not be accepted and I did not want to spend the rest of my life feeling like um, an immigrant among xenophobic people. Um, then there's a most recent example that I don't even have to go over, I'm sure, with you, uh, about Iraq and the stories we heard about Saddam Hussein and what he was attempting to do and what that would mean for the world. And, you know, we're, if we talk about the Afghan Soviet war, probably 30,000 Soviet soldiers were killed and maybe tenfold that many Afghans over a, a made-up story. And in Iraq, I think we can talk about quite a bit of storytelling, uh, both that as Saddam Hussein did. His story was to the international community, you come and fight us, you know, we've, we're going to go after you. We have all this equipment, we have all this military might, and this was for domestic consumption, a story to be told domestically. Maybe he believed it, maybe he didn't, but he intended it to scare the rest of the world. And when it turned out that the Iraqis could barely put up a fight, people wondered what in the world was Saddam thinking when he was saying, you know, this is going to happen to you if you come in and invade. Did he believe it? Did he not? Now getting back to the personal. And again, I'm going to give the most recent story in my life where um, I was walking a treacherous line. And I could probably tell you every week, you know, for the last, uh, for all my life, I could tell you many, many stories. But the most recent one to me was um, where I found myself 
telling a story, making up a story, and potentially getting into a situation where an already delicate relationship with a younger son of mine could have become even more delicate. Uh, we were in Moscow. We had all decided that we couldn't stand doing New Year's one more time outside of the Soviet, uh, outside of Russia. That is, the Russians have a really great way of doing it, and we wanted to all be there together. So we had this wonderful reunion, and there were a few instances where my son, uh, who was staying with his relatives, uh, his in-laws, his wife's parents, um, I heard things that made it sound to me as though. He thought she had a great family, but his family of origin was not a great family. And uh, the final reunion we had, it, like this had been building up, this story in my head where I was imagining that this is the narrative he was giving everybody uh, because he was making toasts to family. You know, family is great. I've understood in this particular trip, how great it is to have a supportive family. And all the time, I think he's talking about his in-laws. And that, you know, um, I was taking the punches. It just so happened that everybody stayed so late in the home where I was staying, my other son's home, that my younger son spent the night there. And his wife went back to his mother's house, her mother's house. And I was so thrilled to find out that I had made up a story that my son had turned on his whole family. And it was now over, our relationship. And I was fighting myself with that because I was saying, no, this is a story. He didn't say that. He didn't say that. This is just a story. But believe me, it was a struggle. And I think that had he not the next morning given me the opportunity to hear what he really meant, um, I probably would have dealt with it and, you know, found a way, some other way, another time to get clarity. But I certainly would have, you know, not done my nerves very good and maybe spewed out a little bit of irritation at other people who had nothing to do with what was going on inside of me. And, and at that point, my son said to me, when he realized I'd made up this story and we laughed about, you know, how I do this, and how damaging it can be to relationships, he said to me, you know, Mom, all your life, da-da-da-da-da, you've done this and you've done that. And I was able to say, you're right. You're really right. And he was so floored that I got the greatest hug of my life. He cried on my shoulder and he said, and you know what, Mom? I do that too in my family. So. I am paying a lot of attention, as you can tell, to the stories that are out there in the international arena, the stories that get told in our own minds about bosses, and I can tell you a few about those too, that would go for the last couple of weeks, uh, even though for several years I had no troubles with bosses. But recently it seems like there are two people of authority that I keep also having to remember, no, these are not people who are out to get you. These are just people who are living their lives. I'm making up the story myself about who they are. And if I just treat them like the people I, I need in my life and around me, um, we will be able to keep up our communication. And I think I forgot to tell you that I had spent decades dropping friends. Um, I never managed to drop this younger son who has been challenging to me. Uh, we didn't go through, what is it, the teenage um, crisis, for, 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 I forget, but the, my older son and I went through that. Um, my younger son and I didn't, but it seems as though after he was 20 and started to get married and so on, it seems like we have this long, long period of misunderstandings that probably would have gotten over with more quickly had we done all that in, in our teenage years, but that's another story, right? Did you hear that? I made it up myself. Well, I want to end with some good news um, that comes from anthropo anthropology. It comes from my own experiences and my own understanding. And probably you can validate it. 